and we're ready. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Surprising with a microphone. Uh, my name is Dave Wagey. I am principal and teacher at the Costa Lutheran Grade School in Campbellsport, and I've been studying the Civil Wars. My kids at school think since it started. <laughs> but uh, I came to love history because I, I got to sit with my grandmother, who was a teacher for three, 33 years. And when she and uh, my mom and aunts would go sit on the kitchen table and tell me to get away from them, I went and read her history books. And one of the books she had was the 1961 Time Life book of the Civil War, which had all of these little bird's eye view pictures. And just, I was fascinated by that. A few years later, I uh, was a high school kid who knew it all. You've all been there, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing about this Iron Brigade and thinking, well, they were pretty cocky, thinking they were all that and calling themselves Iron. But then I found out it was mostly Wisconsin regiments, and then I found out that it wasn't a name they chose, it was a name applied to them because of their exploits. And I started studying some more then with Lance Hurtigan, who was a prof at Carroll University in Waukesha. Went on a few trips that he was a speaker at, and here I am tonight. So, thanks for uh, coming down here. I uh, hope you enjoy this. Any questions at the end we can take. Any questions in the middle we can take, so just Let's have fun. I don't know what's going to come here. I don't have a script that I follow. What I use is a PowerPoint because I think Americans are highly visual creatures and you like to see the way things might have looked. And you like to read print that makes a synopsis of maybe what the guy yakking up front is trying to say. So, 1861, Fort Sumter is fired upon by the rebels. PGT Beauregard in command of those troops. They're lobbing shells into Fort Sumter, which is federal property under command of a man named Robert Anderson. Well, that news hits the rest of the country. Lincoln himself is furious. He calls for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion. And some of that call for volunteers came here. But I am reminded of our present political climate, where the failure to compromise is so obvious, at least to my eyes. Won't get into that, because it's not a popular area to talk about, right? But I look at the Civil War, and I see so many similarities. And when you look at the tone of a, an article from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in 1861, April 1861, it captures modern language very well. The storm cometh. We hope the infatuated rebels like the appearance of the northern horizon. The storm of patriotism may shortly become the hurricane of vengeance, and they have only themselves to thank. And when you look at that, it sounds to me like uh, the northern states were pretty sure this would be a short war and they would come up on top. Then you look at southern newspapers and they were pretty sure it was going to be a short war and those Yankees didn't stand a chance because any southern boys was worth any five of them Yankees. And it finishes with this. Those who sow the wind must reap the whirlwind. You can just see Charles Nesson up there on the mountain right before he slammed the Ten Commandments to the ground, right? <laughs> By the shedding of blood, atonement has always been made for great sins. This rebellion must be put down by blood and treason punished by blood. And this is the governor of Wisconsin talking. And his rhetoric was copied all over the northern states and in the southern states. Governor Randolph also decided that following these words, for the first time in the history of this federal government, organized treason has manifested itself within several states of the Union, and armed rebels are making war against it. I often have a debate with Civil War scholars what the cause of the Civil War was. And of course, most would say now slavery. I like to throw in four S's, slavery, secession, states' rights, and sectionalism. But slavery being the top one. But from the tone of this, I think Wisconsinites were just horrified that those rebels dared fight, fire on our flag. Okay. I don't think many Wisconsinites went down in 1861 over the cause of slavery. He went on to say, a demand made upon Wisconsin by the president for aid to sustain the federal arm must meet with a prompt response. One regiment of the militia of this state will be required for immediate service and further services will be required as the exigencies of the government may demand. And there's something in there that offended him totally. Does anybody catch it? I'll give you a clue. That state to our south, which is much flatter than ours, <laughs> they were asked for over 20 regiments. And Wisconsin is asked for only one. 
that cannot be. He would not tolerate it. And so he sent out a plea, and he has this master plan. He wants to have a brigade comprised entirely of Wisconsin regiments. Now you think about that from a politician's point of view. His boys from his state that he organized, who gets to call the shots? No way was Washington, D.C., especially President Lincoln, going to allow that to happen. So they decided, let's throw out the 5th Wisconsin, and instead we'll bring in the 19th Indiana Volunteers. These are all Western regiments, because we're way out west back in 1860, right? And so the Wisconsin boys were not at all displeased to have the Indianians among them. So you've got Hoosiers and you've got Badgers, and that was a pretty good combination. They are going to be the only all-Western brigade in the Army of the Potomac, which is the Union's Eastern Army. And the fact that they carried that, that thought that we represent the West, maybe explains partly why they did so well. They considered themselves elite, and their record proved that they weren't off the, the mark at all by saying that. Alan Nolan wrote the first really, really solid book on the Iron Brigade, and he asked a friend of mine, what do you suppose made the Iron Brigade such a good outfit? Well, some would say training, some would say this one, some would say that. But the man who gave him this answer was told, you're the first guy that's got it right. He said, and here he is, don't you suppose John Gibbon had something to do with that? <clears throat> now Wayne over there knows John Gibbon. John Gibbon was regular army. He was from North Carolina and three brothers who fought for the Confederacy. So it's that brother against brother situation, you know, at the top ranks of, of the military. And John Gibbon, being regular army, saw the, the stuff of the Wisconsin soldier, the lumberjacks, the tradesmen, the farm boys, and he said, I can do something with that. He also recognized that people who moved out to Wisconsin from the east were probably of a kind of independent streak. And being independent, he had to handle them carefully. We're going to see how that goes shortly. <laughs> This is John Gibbon. He's a rough-looking character. He's uh, called Johnny the War Horse by some of the people, uh, by some of the soldiers. But if we read that, probably no brigade commander was more cordially hated by his men. He was all soldier, both in looks and deeds. Gibbon was, one veteran said, a most thorough disciplinarian. And the manner in which he put the brigade through the drill will never be forgotten by those who participated. Those of you who have served in the military, there's code here for the fact that they hated Guy because they ran him ragged. But they also knew for a fact, a year down the road, that if it wasn't for John Gibbon, many of them wouldn't have survived their first battle. So he was a regular army man who knew what he was doing, it's just he wasn't appreciated at the time. A man named Jerome Watrous. Look at that baby face. I had a student six years ago who could have been his twin, and I put my uniform on him, and it was like looking at a ghost. He survives the war, and he wrote a whole series of newspaper articles in Milwaukee, and he eventually became the governor of the soldiers' home near Miller Park. Gibbon was a soldier. They were not when he took them. He knew what was before them. He knew how much they needed the discipline he was giving them, and they learned to most keenly appreciate it before they were a year older. Um, I'm sure those of you in the military keenly appreciated those who trained you eventually. I'm not seeing any reaction. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they look like. So the uniform I'm wearing represents that, minus the bum wing over here. Um, blue pants, they're sky blue infantry pants, they're 100% wool, hotter than all get out in the summer. And yet, because they were wool, that the cloth breathed pretty well. That does not separate them from anybody. But do you realize at the start of the war, the first battle of Bull Run, there were Union troops in gray, the second Wisconsin. There were Southern troops, Virginia troops in blue. And the fact that both sides had a red, white, and blue flag with stripes, not the, not the stars and bars you used to see. Very, very confusing. Well, John Gibbon, as I said, is given the job of training these Wisconsin boys to make them something. And he thought the way to do that is to give them a certain cachet, a certain esprit de corps. So two of the infantry pants, which could be dark blue for the regular army, or light blue as later units wore, he decided I'm going to give them this tall black hat. It's called an 1858 Hardy campaign hat. Now Hardy turns out to be a Confederate general, but he also wrote Hardy's tactics, which is the tactics both sides used to fight the war. 
That's kind of interesting. Both sides were trained in the same college, West Point. Both sides prepped for the war in the Mexican War, and then they both used the same tactics, and you wonder why it took four years. <laughs> but this hat has the tall crown, the wide brim. Many soldiers often wore one side pinned up with a pin that was called the Jeff Davis pin after Jefferson Davis, who is now president of the, of the rebellion. It has a blue cord in it to represent the infantry, a horn in front like a hunting horn, it's an infantry horn, and then the E, which is Company E and the 6th of the 6th Wisconsin. I need a romantic. Is there a romant romantic? You look romantic. <laughs> what do you see there in the, in the infantry horn? Looks like some feathers. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a lock of my beloved. Yeah. When I went, you knew that, you were just playing, playing <laughs> head. So when I went off to war, I would carry in my pocket a pencil because this was a letter writing generation that recorded everything that happened. The letters they wrote home are filled with some of the most poetic language you can imagine. Uh, some of you have seen that, whether it's in German or in English, you just think, oh, these people knew what they were about. But I believe they also knew they were living the biggest event of their lives. So besides my stub of a pencil, I might have some paper in my pocket. I would have a lock of my lady love. Okay, hi. And in the pocket of my vest, which I must wear in public because otherwise I'm considered undressed if my suspenders are showing. Of course, in this pocket up here, I would have my cell phone. <laughs> Together with the black hat, they had the frock coat. You can see it's rather long. It's rather heavy. I wore this in a photo shoot, believe it or not, at Gettysburg, and it was 90 degrees, wool pants, heavy shirt, vest, the big hat, and this coat. And I was like three sizes smaller when I walked off a little round top. <laughs> the photo shoot was not for anything important. We just wanted a record of a group of guys that hang around and misbehave all summer. <laughs> all right, so that's a uniform that Gibbon gave them. You can see it represented here. Many of the hats have the side pinned up with that Jeff Davis pin, you can see the infantry horn. Then you see this guy here. His head is folded down. And I asked myself, if I was actually in the Civil War at that time, I would have worn this hat for comfort. The regular army didn't want it. It's heavy. But look at the brim on that. And farm boys who have been behind the handles of a plow are going to want something with a brim on it. As opposed to that baseball-looking cap, Kepi, that's over there. Would you lift up that blue cap, please? Thank you, Vanna. So that's the Kepi, and that was made popular um, in Europe, and a lot of the troops wanted to emulate the French troops because they were supposedly the elite. Well, not the Wisconsin boys. They wanted to be different, and they made this uniform something to be proud of. You can also see on their legs they're wearing white gaiters. You see those? How many are campers? How many of you are campers? Okay, white's a good color for camping, isn't it? Stays clean. Well, they wore these gaiters made of canvas that went part way up your leg. It was supposed to protect your pants. It was supposed to protect your ankles, but you had to keep them spotless white. Again, military guys, you're aware of that. Keep those buttons clean, those shoes polished, and they were given white gloves. White gloves in camp, white gaiters in camp, and John Gibbon is dealing with these guys. Look at their faces. They're not guys to mess with. But one morning, John Gibbon came out of his tent. He found his horse wearing four of those gaiters. <laughs> and he decided at that point, you know what? I think I've pushed these guys as far as I want to. They are the material that I can use to make some awesome troops from. But I think they've reached their limit. Interestingly enough, at one of the reunions after the Civil War, all the boys were inside the hall and they were swapping stories and probably exaggerating a few of them. There's a pounding at the door and somebody goes to answer it. It turns out it's General Gibbon come to visit his Wisconsin boys. Apparently the guy who answered the door slammed it in his face. He was so shocked. And he said, it's Johnny the War Horse. Come to see who put the gators on his horse. <laughs> so there was a certain camaraderie between these guys, and I would even go so far as to say a love and a respect. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. So if that's what you wanted to hear, well, wait and see where we're going, where we're going with it. They were called the Black Hats for obvious reasons. Many of them were over six feet tall. Well, I'm 6'4". You put the hat on, and you can see where they got the nickname Giants in their tall black hats. There are many records of the Rebs seeing this hat coming at them, and they realized that they were up against it because it wasn't militia, it wasn't other 
units of the Army of the Potomac. It was the best of the best, the Union shock troops. So before they were the Iron Brigade or Gibbons Black Cats, they were just the boys of 61. They hadn't yet made the mark for themselves, but they were farm boys, they were mechanics, they were newspaper men, they were you and they were me, off to fight war. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. Not the generals, not the captains so much. A guy I knew wrote this poem about Company E of the Calico 6th. He's standing in front of you tonight. Company E of the Calico 6th. At Mr. Lincoln's call, after Sumter fell, before civil war unleashed its own special hell, from law firms and business, from fields and farms, men left hearth and home to take up arms to join the fight with Company E. Some names of renown, like both Brown and Bragg, stood steadfast together under the country's old flag. Names unknown, left <coughs> Gaffney, the Garfield boys, forsick without qualms or familial joys, to sign on the line with Company E. At Gainesville, Antietam, and Gettysburg too, all fought and some died wearing proud Union blue. This talk shares their tales and addresses the glory of the 6th Regiment and part of its story, huzzah and well met, O Company E. And if that was the introduction, you're in for a long siege here, okay? Here's where we're going tonight. Names no one's ever heard of. We're gonna look at the brothers, Ralph, and Major Garfield, a man named Nicholas Gaffney, and a man named Amos Luffler, three of whom lived and farmed within a softball throw of the school at which I teach. The last one, Amos Luffler, actually was a Canadian, came down from Toronto in the late 1850s and was a hired man, fell in love with the farmer's daughter, you all know that story, and uh, you will become part of our talk tonight. Where to find these guys, you've got the roster of Wisconsin Volunteers for the War of the Rebellion. Anybody who wants to do research, this is your starting point. This will have every single regiment that went off from Wisconsin. You'll have them listed by regiment and by company. And here we have the page for the 6th Wisconsin Company. You look at some of the names up there. Flood from Fond du Lac, a bunch of guys from Appleton, and right here, Nick Gaffney from Acousta. Major A. and Ralph Garfield from Wacusta, all signed up July 1st, 1861, and the sad thing is, the youngest one of the crew, Ralph, never even made it to the front lines. He died at Arlington, Virginia. Now, Arlington House was Robert E. Lee's home, are you aware of that? Where Arlington National Cemetery is now, and the Iron Brigade was encamped upon those grounds when this man took sick and died. So he made it back home. Many in the Civil War, especially enlisted men, their bodies never were returned. So you go to their grave sites today, and the stone is there, and maybe a GAR marker, but the body is elsewhere. Somebody recognize this guy? This is Captain Edwin A. Brown, and his descendant is sitting here in the back row. You want to hold your hand and wave it? Both extremely good-looking men, in my opinion. <laughs> He wrote this, and this man, if you want to have a poster boy for patriotism, it might well have been him. Thousands of patriotic lives may lay a be laid a sacrifice on the altar of our country's good. But this country will be purified of this blighting breath of treason and corruption. He had a way with words. And he also was a prolific writer. He wrote letter after letter after letter home. In 1961, his series of letters were published in The Reporter. And uh, I don't know if you said you have a copy of some of his letters? Yes, I do. Can I have them? <laughs> okay, never mind. I didn't really say that. It came out loud. I was just thinking it. 1862, the town of Osceola in Fond du Lac County. Here where these guys live. Nick Gaffney on the far left, right on the big bend in 45 before you come to Augusta. Right on the shores of, you've got Round Lake and Mud Lake. Um, Major Garfield lived beyond Mud Lake, and I know the people who live there now, they might let me into their attic someday, I'd be really thrilled. And way over toward Dundee, you had Ralph Garfield still living at home with his folks. And my school is right there. So like I said, this is very personal stuff to me. But I don't have an ancestor in the Civil War. But I have kids in my classroom who need to learn that those lives were given for something that was so much bigger than themselves. Uh, last year in April, our classroom went out to Gettysburg and Antietam and Harper's Ferry. And it was the greatest thing in the world because this year we're studying the Civil War. 
You see their heads nodding. They've been there. They've walked hallowed ground. Well, I submit that this is hallowed ground too because all these volunteers signed up for, for the cause. They signed up for the flag. And that's why we're talking about them tonight, obviously. A picture called Black Hat Baptism by a, a painter and artist named Mike Thorson from Wisconsin. And it's a story of the first battle fought by the Black Hat Boys. The book up in front with John Gibbons' picture on it, it's next to the one that's red and black. It's called Brave Men's Tears. And the story basically was that as the Black Hats were walking up this road towards Centerville, Virginia, they're looking for some guy, uh, what was his name, Stonewall Jackson? He had disappeared off the face of the earth, and the Union had to try to find him. Jackson was out there as bait. The Union army being separated, they might have been able to do what they called defeating them in detail. Hit segments of the Union army a piece at a time. Well, they were followed by these guys. They had never been in combat before, only the second Wisconsin had been. So they had kind of an attitude that they were better than everybody else. But the 6th, the 7th, and the 19th Indiana had never shot at anybody truly in anger. And as they were mar marching along the road, John Gibbon, who was a former artillerist, looked up on the hill and he saw, oh, there's some horse artillery going up there, and oh, look, they're going into battery. They're unhooking the cannons and pointing them our way. He recognized what that meant. Well, infantry liked nothing better than a trophy or two, so how would you go and capture those cannons? So he detailed his regiment with experience, the 2nd Wisconsin, go up and grab those. And as the second Wisconsin went up the slope, it's about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon, out of the woods came the entire Stonewall Brigade. At the time, the Stonewall Brigade, which had stood firm at 1st Manassas or 1st Bull Run, was the elite troops of the Army of Northern Virginia. And so here you have these Wisconsin rookies going up against what was arguably the best unit in Lee's Army. And as they came out of the woods, I can only imagine John Gibbons' thoughts. He had to feed more regiments in to support the second, and what should have been a capturing of a trophy turned into a slugfest at about 70 yards, using firepower, rifle muskets that were accurate at 300 yards. And so it was a, a slaughter. But the Southern boys thought that those Yankees would run. In the past, that's generally what had happened. But this was the Iron Brigade of the West, and these are the men who had something to prove. And so, into the dying uh, night of the, into the dying night, they traded shot for shot, never backed down until the sun was down and they were firing only at muzzle flashes. Here is where Major Garfield takes a wound. Now, this poem about the Battle of Gainesville just talks about how the Iron Brigade came marching through the same area not too long later, and many of the bodies had become uncovered by either hogs or by the weather. If you take that and pass it around, I'm handing out what's uh, called a mini ball. It's got a hollowed back end. It's got some grooves in it. When it's fired, the back end expands and catches the grooves in the rifle barrel, causing it to be really accurate, pretty much like an Aaron Rodgers pass. Keep in mind that weighs about an ounce, okay? And that's going to be important as we talk about Major Garfield here shortly. So, Black Cat Baptism, what a great name. Rufus Dawes is a captain in the 6th Wisconsin at this time. You ever heard the name Dawes before in American history? Yeah, uh, his grandfather, William Dawes, rode with Paul Revere to say, the British are coming, the British are coming. We've all heard that story growing up, right? And so now his grandson, Rufus Dawes, is leading Wisconsin boys. He himself is from Marietta, Georgia. He has moved to Wisconsin to attend the University of Wisconsin, and his father owns some lumber property up near Mauston. So he signs up with Company K out of Austin, Wisconsin. Early in the war, everyone thought, as I said before, it's going to be one big battle and done. And they didn't want to miss the biggest event of their life, so they signed up to go fight for the flag. Well, now that they've been in a battle and they've seen what these bullets can do to human flesh and blood, and as they've lost friends, Rufus Dawes said, our one night's experience at Gainesville eradicated our yearning for a fight. In our future history, we were always found ready but never again anxious. This is from the Fond du Lac, Wisconsin newspaper, September 20th, um, shortly after the Battle of Gainesville, which is also called the Battle of Brauner Farm. It's the opening to Second Bull Run, I think I said before. 
And if you blow this up a little bit, which we can do with technology, it says M. A. Garfield, arm, severely. And then it says Amos Leffler, who is another one of the guys we're going to talk about. He's listed as being wounded twice during the war, but I found two other times he was hit. So apparently sometimes when guys are hit, they just don't tell their family because it's like none of their business. Okay? I say that because my Marine just walked in back there, and uh, apparently he's neglected to tell his parents a few things too. So anyway, M.A. Garfield is hit by that one ounce of lead. When that bullet hits you, when it hits flesh, when it hits bone, it expands because it's soft lead, and it's traveling at a low muzzle velocity, so it's not burning off any bacteria. It's been loaded by ripping a cartridge open, so it's got the enemy's spit on it, loaded into the barrel, fired, not heating up, then it hits you and goes through dirty cloth. So this bullet that hit him in the arm could well have shattered bone, but eventually the arm is amputated, and he dies of blood poisoning, what they call sepsis. So both Garfield brothers that went off to fight for Makusa, one died of disease, and one has a headstone in the New Prospect Cemetery by the old Fin and Feather restaurant on Highway G near Dundee, and uh, his body isn't there, it's somewhere in Virginia. The story continues with him. Here are some of his medical records, we won't look at those tonight. It just tells what happened to him. But they had to establish that he was in honorary combat, that he was not a deserter, that he was with his regiment when he was injured or killed, because if you didn't establish that, then the pension office didn't have to pay their pension. And their whopping pension of six, seven, or eight dollars a month could go a long way in those days. So his wife is supposed to get this pension, and for a while she does, but they fall on hard times, and they wind up moving out near Detroit. Well, from Detroit happens to be the regiment 24th Michigan. They are the fifth and final regiment of the Iron Brigade. They joined up just before Gettysburg. So now the Iron Brigade is the second Wisconsin, the fifth Wisconsin, the seventh Wisconsin, the 19th Indiana, and the 24th Michigan. The Garfield surviving members of the family, including their young daughter named Lydia, live near Detroit, and as I said, they're fallen in hard times, and Lydia winds up in an asylum. An asylum was like a poorhouse at the time. She was sick, she was dying. So the word came to the 24th Michigan at one of their reunions that a former comrade's family is in dire straits. They found out about it, they took up a collection. And when the girl died, they saw that she was buried with great honors. That says something about the nature of these men, I think, about the, the comrade, camaraderie that they had. As I said, we've got to make sure that we note everything, that there's got to be a record. So this man, Joseph Marston, was a captain in Company E, and this is what he wrote. He made sure that he said, Garfield was in line of battle, facing the enemy, and that his death was as a result of action, of hostile action. So now the family can get that pension. Now you'd think that would be obvious, right? But again, if you have any dealings with the government, that's not always the case. I got a letter late one time. That was funny. Okay, this is a newspaper article from the Detroit Daily Post in 1871 that told the whole story. And I don't even remember how I found this. I was going through an internet search looking for information on M.A. Garfield. And here this thing pops up, and it was just such an incredibly touching story. We think so often of the men who carried the muskets. Well, what about the wives back home? What about their children? And this is how this family wound up, with the daughter dying, but her dad's comrades taking care of it for her. And right here we have, in this weed patch toward the back, the GAR marker and the stone for M.A. Garfield in New Prospect. Visit it sometime. You know, we go to a cemetery, there's some neat stuff to see. How many have been to Ranzi? You know, you tell people, yeah, I hang out at the cemetery, and you get some looks, don't you? <laughs> Again, Edwin A. Brown. He was that prolific letter writer. He was married to Ruth. Okay, Ruth Pyre. Okay. 
I have just time to write you a line, nothing more. You are doubtless informed of the defeats of our army, which explains our being here. He was a passionate man. The underlining is his own. Three times has my life been in jeopardy, where danger was in every inch of space. You can say to your friends that your husband was no coward, where so many showed the white feather. Notice the date, September 13th, 1862. What happened the next day? September 14th, 1864, two, sorry. <coughs> the Battle of South Mountain, which is the prelude to the Battle of Antietam. He wrote this letter September 13th, and then he signs it in a way that I think is so unique. Kiss the babies from their war-worn father. Goodbye, E.A. Brown. And that is his final goodbye. Because he will be killed September 17th at Antietam, leading his troops in battle. And the odd thing is, a letter from his father crosses this one in the mail, in which Dad says, I'm sure you'll be fine. The gracious God who has protected you to this point will not let you fall. And there's more to that story if we have time later on and you're not all sleeping. The bloody cornfield without the corn, and now we look at the story of Nick Gaffney. Nick Gaffney, a young man from just up north of us in Wacousta, as I was saying before, that's rural Wacousta, not downtown. <laughs> As the Iron Brigade came through the cornfield, they were met on the other side by some Georgia troops who had been lying down. They rose up in a thin gray line and let loose with a volley. And Rufus Dawes, who was leading at this time also, said the men were knocked out of the ranks in windrows. Just like mowing the grass, there was men lying just as they had gone into battle. And because they were the Iron Brigade, it didn't stop and they kept on going. They drove the Georgians back, they drove some Louisianians back, the only thing that stopped them was thousands of Texans under a man named John Bell Hood, who finally drove them back. But this 30 to 40 acre cornfield was harvested completely. There was so much lead that flew. Well, in this cornfield, Rufus Dawes makes the comment that the flower of the regiment was slaughtered there. It was a bad place to be. This man here is not the Mark's big boy model, if you remember that restaurant chain. <laughs> This is um, Edward Brank. Edward Brank was somebody in Fond du Lac. He was also law partners with Edwin A. Brown. Okay. Just before the Battle of Antietam, he got a new uniform coat. It was lined with red silk. Brown had just become captain, so he passed his captain's uniform on to Brown, and they go into battle. In that cornfield, as Bragg is coming through, Nick Gafty says to him, I am shot, Colonel. I'm going to die. No, Gaffney, you're not going to die. Let me see your wound. So he opens his jacket. He's been shot through the body, through the left lung. That same one inch or one ounce lead bullet went in like the tip of my finger and came out the size of my fist. Went in the left side next to the nipple, came through right near the spine, and took out a whole chunk of his back with it, along with a big part of his lungs. But it's not... Bragg's job to tell him that, so he tells him, you're all right, chicken, said Bragg, putting his hand over the wound. <laughs> Take a long breath. It hurt Gaffney like the cut of a knife, and the colonel's hand came away covered with blood. Well, later, Bragg says he was sure that this Gaffney was going to die. I mean, with a wound like that, you can't survive. But he, he sent him off to the aid station, where they proceeded to do the best they could. We all know what triage is, right? Those casualties who can't be saved are made comfortable and left to expire, peacefully, we hope. But then you've got the second and third class who are going to be taken care of in the order of how, how well you can save them. Well, this man was treated right away. And how did they clean the wound? They got a rag made out of silk, which is a natural material. It's not going to leave threads behind that would infect and cause sepsis or blood poisoning. They put the rag on a ramrod and slowly slid it through the exit wound. So they, they pushed it in from the front and out the back and cleaned out cloth and things from Nick's own uniform. Uh, okay. <laughs> he survived. After the war, he actually was a town chairman in Osceola. And so he, he had a good life after the war. He was married. We're going to see the results of that coming up here shortly. But the neat thing about this, too, is the War Department is also keeping better records. And so you can get a file on these guys, and here are the wounds 
that the War Department recorded for Nick Gaffney. The entry wound going in his chest, the exit wound coming out the back. So if you have relatives, if you have ancestors who fought in the Civil War, and you want to get their records, they're all available at the National, National Archives. I have Leffler, I have Garfield, I have a few others, and I definitely have this guy, Gaffney. The ball entered in front, two inches above and to the outside of the nipple, passed through the lung and came out on backside, three inches lower. Many times going to battle, they were leaning into the fight, almost like you would be leaning into a rainstorm. And so it entered high and came out a little bit lower. There is a cavity in back, part of lung, has occasional hemorrhage. For the rest of his life, this man would cough, and if he coughed too hard, he'd cough up blood. There's also a story of a man who was shot through the lungs and down the road one day, sitting at the supper table, started coughing, coughed up the bullet that had been in there for 20 years. Were they tougher than us today? I don't think so, but goodness gracious. Again, Joseph Marston has to write this letter. I certify on honor that Nick Gaffney formerly blah, 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 a uh, musket ball entered the left lung, so he's establishing that Nick Gaffney took this wound in combat against enemies of the United States, the federal government. In 1880, Nick Gaffney's still with us. Here's our Osceola Township. Here are his vital statistics. I like the one that says relationship to head of house, self, which meant he was in control. At 39 years old, he was married, it says. He, his father was from Ireland, and he is a farmer. And then it shows us the Gaffney Farm right here, okay? And there another Gaffney place well, right there, right up there. And um, a family that I have in school actually farms that land today. So I get goosebumps thinking about that stuff. How well did he do after the war? Okay, he was not incapacitated, as you might imagine. <laughs> His wife Eunice and he had a daughter Henrietta, a son Thomas, a son John, a son Ambrose, and two more daughters, Mary and Clara, in 1880. Two more after that, and poor Eunice decided that's enough and decided she had to die. <laughs> so on March 10, 1884, this man, Nicholas Gaffney, had a huge family, but farm families were like that. This was your workforce, this was your legacy, if you want to call it that. And these men who had been off to see the elephant, they wanted to leave something behind that was walking flesh and blood. I guess we know where he didn't get wounded. <laughs> Could you explain it? <laughs> that was a little higher, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, what was that? Is that you again? <laughs> anyway, he applied for a pension. I mean, picture the wound he had, and he's rejected on February of 1886 because his wound wasn't incapacitating. This is before that census that proved us wrong. He tries again two years later. His claim is rejected. <coughs> and again. Until finally somebody saw fit to realize the service this man had rendered to our nation. And he finally gets a pension. Look, it says reduced to six dollars. He wasn't hurt badly enough to get a full pension of eight dollars. And then increased over the years until 1978 till February 10th, 1890. But he had to get a letter from a doctor proving he'd been hurt in battle. And read this. This is the letter from the doctor saying that Nick was hurt in battle. I'm not going to read that to you. You pretty much can see what it says, okay? It's establishing the same thing Joseph Marston did. But here's the reply from the, from the government. In response to your letter, September 14, 1912, received September 16th, relative to that part of your cited claim, you were advised that the evidence on file fails to show that by reason of gunshot wound of left lung alone, for which you were previously pensioned under the general law, you are unfit to perform manual labor as contemplated by the Act of May 11, 1912. That as a fact, you do not perform manual labor by reason of said disability alone. Translation. Your wound isn't what keeps you from farming anymore. Eunice is gone, the kids are moved out, and here's a picture of J.L. Davenport. It looks somewhat like Scrooge, doesn't he? <laughs> Nick Gaffney winds up the soldier's home in Milwaukee. Beautiful, beautiful building. 
recently purchased and is going to all be renovated. It is an architectural gem, right in the shadows of Miller Park. That's where he, he ends his life as a member in company with fellow soldiers who fought for the Union. And that's the graveyard up there in the National Cemetery above Miller Park. The final note for Nick, see the stamp on the bottom? And here's where Nick stays now. In the shadows of Miller Park, I heard he's a big Brewer fan. But I like to get a picture of one of my hardy hats next to these stones. Because to me, that it's like going to some of these battlefields. It's just, there's a feeling you get being by the men who, who gave so much. Sir? So when you said the uh, Wakusta gravesite, he's not buried there. Are the gravesites down in Milwaukee, are, are they buried there? Or is that all show also? Most of these men in the National Cemetery were brought back home. They were. It's a little private, private cemeteries. Let's face it, to get your body back home, you had to pay to have it shipped. And most enlisted men didn't have that. Sometimes families would go out there and get the body. Um, Garfield is not Nick Gaffney is because he died on the grounds. And so that his body is under that stone. That is not Nick Gaffney. That is Lance Hurtigan, the man who wrote many of the books up there. He is the guru of the Iron Brigade. And he was at a talk I gave recently, so I put that up there just to stick a needle in him. <laughs> And now we come to the final man we're talking about tonight, and I'm on time, this is really cool. Originally, I got interested in the Civil War, I told you the story about, you know, reading in my grandmother's library. <clears throat> Sorry, I was getting a little excited there. And this is Amos Luffler, okay? It says he signed up May 18th, 1861, and finally like, Captain Bragg signed him up personally, which I think is kind of cool. He went off to Madison, and he's 26 years old. Says he's married. Well, military records aren't as all, always as accurate as it should be. He was not married at the time. He had his eye on the local Francis Cooter, that girl, but they hadn't married yet. I was in Gettysburg on McPherson's Ridge, and this little guy was just giving me the eye. It made me uncomfortable. My name tag said Dave Wiggy, and then it said Campbell's, Wisconsin. It was a typo. So he came over after Lance Hurtigan was done talking and said, do you by any chance know where Eden, Wisconsin is? I said, yep. <laughs> and then he explained that his ancestor, Amos, lived in Eden before the war, and he is always trying to find out more information about him. What he understood was that when Amos Leffler came home from the Civil War with a horrible, horrible wound, he was a hired hand for a local large farmer. Okay. So keep that in mind as the story continues. Gettysburg, July 1st, four regiments of the Iron Brigade in blue are coming through McPherson's woods to hit the troops of James Archer coming through Willoughby Run. As the blue troops come into line of battle, the second Wisconsin there on top, they don't even have loaded muskets yet. They're loading on the run. As they came over the crest of the hill, the Confederates, who had been told that Gettysburg was only held by militia, so not well-trained troops, saw the black cats and said, taint no militia, it's some damn black-headed fellers. <laughs> Sorry about that word. But that's what they said, I'm only quoting. Meanwhile, here is a Lutheran seminary made famous in the movie Gettysburg. Ladies, that's where Sam Elliott was during the movie, okay? The 6th Wisconsin is held in reserve down below. And it's, the whole unit is commanded by this guy in the picture. His name is Solomon Meredith from Indiana. He's about six foot seven. They called him Long Saul. How the rebels didn't shoot him before, I don't know, as big as he was. But it's good to have a reserve. So the 6th Wisconsin is held there as Confederate troops are trying to come around and flank on the other side of the Chambersburg Pike. There's a railroad cut there, an unfinished railroad cut that to the rebel eyes looked like the perfect position to f play defense, but also to launch an attack on the flank. And if you could have a flank attack in the Civil War, that was about as good as it would get. Well, as the six is standing there, this handsome fella, Abner Doubleday, famous for what? Baseball. It's a lie, he didn't do that. But anyway, <laughs> he says that it was the critical moment of the battle, and if that Iron Brigade didn't hold those woods because all of the troops have been driven back. 
that the battle would have been lost. One regimental historian said, if the Iron Brigade had not held on July 1st, there would have been no July 2nd and 3rd. And when Doubleday says to them, can you men hold these woods? They said, if you don't see men here who can, where will you find men who will? Or something to that effect. There was that unit pride we talked about. And those black-headed fellows were tough. I immediately sent for one of Meredith's regiments, the 6th Wisconsin, a gallant body of men whom I knew could be relied upon. And they ran off across the road. They had to cross two fences. The one fence is a post and rail fence. It's on the bottom of the screen there. Built by German farmers. You're not going to knock it over. They tried during Gettysburg. And those posts were so deep by those Deutsch, they had to climb over or through the fence, which laid you out there as a perfect target for the enemy. When they crossed the Chambersburg Pike, they then had to cross a snake rail fence, which we see in our area quite a bit, to split rails lying, lying against each other. And as they got across that fence, Dawes is shot, or just before crossing the fence, Dawes is shot off his horse. They thought he was dead. He goes flying off the horse, pops up, and kind of does an I'm okay thing, and kept on leading. In fact, he was so supercharged with adrenaline, he winds up at the point of the attack. That is not where he belonged. He's also with the color party. The color party carries the flag. It's a target for the troops in the railroad cut. Well, those Mississippi troops saw that Iron Brigade coming, and they thought they had him in perfect position. That's about 175 yards. This uh, April, when my students went out to Gettysburg, we reenacted that charge with those colors right over there. And it turns out there's a police officer up on the bridge, and he videotaped the whole thing, or we never would have had a videotape. Later on, he said, if only I knew who did that. And a friend of mine said, I knew who they are. I fed them supper last night. And so I got a hold of that story. It was pretty cool. But in this attack, you see the, the V formation. Um, right here is Amos Luffler. Amos Luffler, the young man from Canada, right up there in the front. The 175 paces from the second rail fence to the railroad cut was a swirling hell of bullets, smoke, shouts, and confusion. In Company C, the Jayhawkers from Prairie du Chien, Lieutenant Warren Chapman was down and dying. The rebel flag here is the flag of the second Mississippi. You see Rufus Dawes with raised sword, and in the background, the left side, you see the McPherson barn. So these troops are right on each other, and the railroad cut, you can see, gets fairly deep. And it becomes a trap for the rebel soldiers instead of a good defensive position because the Union troops of the Iron Brigade plug up the end of the railroad cut and soon 200 troops have to surrender. They're looking up in the gun muzzles and Dawes tells them, surrender, I'm going to shoot. To his surprise, they did. And they started handing him swords as a token of surrender and he kind of looked around, what do I do with these? So he sent them back together with the flag of the 2nd Mississippi, which is one not with a bayonet or a bullet, but with a fist fight over the flag, sent back. It's wrapped around the body of a man who's been shot through both legs. His name is Cornelius Oakey. So he's kind of hobbling back, carrying this flag and some of those swords. He is in a private home on a feather bed when the rebels take the town. And he's thinking to himself, I've got this flag, this trophy. I don't want to lose it. So he opens the feather bed, shoves it inside, and calmly is taken prisoner. But the flag survived and it's in Wisconsin to this day. And now back to our story. That was a commercial. <laughs> On the left of the line, Lloyd Harris was struck in the neck by buckshot, and here it is. In Company E, Amos Leffler of Eden was shot in the face and went down spitting blood and teeth. Okay, and Nick Gaffney took a hard one in the chest. Major Garfield took it in the arm and it killed him. What do you think a bullet in the face is gonna do to you? Here's his medical record. It says he received a gunshot wound in the mouth, cutting away part of his lip, slashing a few across his left cheek, tearing away a portion of his under jaw, and carrying off eight teeth. It goes on to describe his wounds a little bit more, and it says he now has trouble chewing his food. <laughs> He's a casualty sheet. is actually listed as missing in action after Gettysburg. They couldn't find him. But I would imagine some of that has to do with the fact he was unrecognizable because of the location of his wound. He's transferred out to the 22nd Veterans Reserve Corps 
the VRC, the Veterans Reserve Corps. They were soldiers who were wounded severely, but still able to do guard duty, duty, warehouse duty, and drive wagons and things like that. So there are two regiments of the Veterans Reserve Corps, and that's what Leftler becomes a part of. He fulfills his full three-year commitment to the country after that wound. More description of the wound. And now he has to write a letter. And in his letter to the pension office, he has to describe why he's fit to receive a pension. I'm kind of running out of gas here for a while. Anybody want to read this letter out loud? Would you, sir? You can say no. No. <laughs> wow, I didn't expect that. I'll read it. I'll read it. Was it a volunteer? Yes. Mr. Vilsky, is it you? It's me. He is a retired teacher and principal. You need help with the big words? <laughs> My name is Amos Leffler. I reside in the town of Eden, Fond du Lac County, Wisconsin. I enlisted in Company E, 6th Regiment, Wisconsin Infantry, at Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, on the 18th day of June, 1861, and was mustered into the service of the United States, 16th day of July, 1861, at Madison, Wisconsin, for a term of three years. That's a long letter, Bill. <laughs> no. I have to stand up. <laughs> that on the first day of July, 1863, I was wounded in the left cheek and lower jaw while on duty in my company and regiment in the Battle of Gettysburg. That my said wound was received while charging the enemy on the first day of July as aforesaid and on the first day of said battle. That a portion of my jaw was torn away and eight of my teeth were knocked out. What's he establishing here? that he was shot in combat in service of his nation so he can get his eight bucks a month. That I went to a hospital, it being a field hospital, and remained four days laid up with said wound. And that I then went to the regimental hospital of the 6th Wisconsin Regiment, and my said wound was dressed by... Surgeon. Oh, it's surgeon, okay. Surgeon Hall of said regiment, and a portion of the jaw taken out. Need some water, Bill? No, not yet. I was transferred to the Invalid Corps, Veteran Retirement Corps, into Company B of the 23rd Regiment of said Corps um, until expiration of my time of enlistment and that I was discharged from the service of the United States on the 20th day of July, 1864, at Washington, D.C. That my occupation is that of a farmer, and that I depend upon my labor for support. That in uh, that in consequence of the wound in my face, aforesaid, my face is disfigured. I would say the least. My teeth were part of the of them gone. Uh, the uh, what is it? The proper mastication. Oh, the proper mastication of any food is prevented. I, isn't mastication where you have to chew it 40 times? Uh, my health is impaired and I suffer much pain about my ear and side of my face and head. My hearing is sometimes materially affected and particularly at and immediately prior to a storm. I suffer pain in my head as aforesaid and am thereby prevented from attending to my usual avocation and at such times I work with considerable difficulty and inconvenience. Amos Leffler, dated July 7th, 1871. He has to establish that he was wounded severely enough in honorable service to deserve a pension. I see a lot of heads shaking, right? He's a farmer. Imagine this. Now, I happen to know a little bit something about prosthetics, and I am told that he was a candidate for a facial prosthetic. They actually had faces that they could fix, more or less, with a rubber facial prosthetic at the time. I don't know if he had one, okay? He was not a rich man, obviously. Well, he comes home back to the town of Eden after the war. This is the, the map of Eden. He's married. After his wounding, that girl he had his eye on did not desert him. She stuck by his side, and they raised a family together. Remember, he's just a hired man. But then I met Larry on the Furson's Ridge at the tour of the Lance Hurt again, and he got me interested in this guy. So I came here to the Fond du Lac Library, and I just started looking through old maps, and I found something that a lot of researchers had missed. 
Here is the farm that he worked for, the Odekirks. James Odekirk, there's an Odekirk Cemetery on Highway F near Eden. Here is where the Cooters lived. There's a Goodex Cemetery off Highway V where all the Cooters are buried. And there's a lot of poison ivy there too. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> but in the 1862 township map, you can see down in the bottom, there's 40 acres right there owned by the St. Mary family, which was a big family in the area at the time. They sold some of that land. And in the 1874 township map, it says it's owned by somebody named, guy named A. Lefter. So anybody doing research found the wrong name. Lefter is not Leffler, and they missed it. It turns out the L was changed into a T because of the symbol that's used for swampland. And that symbol was right through the name Leffler. <coughs> That's kind of cool because I was now able to tell Larry, you know what? Your grand, great grandfather in Wisconsin was actually a landowner. And that's what the dream was for people coming to America, wasn't it? So there he was, right there. In 2005, I did a presentation like this at a state teachers conference. And sitting in the audience was Larry Leffler. So I'm talking about Amos and what I've done, I said, and sitting back there is a descendant of Amos. And he kind of stood up, he was sheepish and everything, and he got a standing ovation from a room full of teachers. And then he and I walked out there, and we walked the land that his great-grandfather had, had farmed. Just beautiful, beautiful land. There's a, off of Highway F, there's a Creek View Road. You get on that road and pretty soon it's gravel and you are driving in the 1860s for goodness sakes. And where that road ends is the land that this man owned before he moved to Nebraska. And there's Larry on his ancestors' farmland. I tell him he has a winning smile. <laughs> Amos Leffler, born July 23, 1837 near Toronto, moved to Fond du Lac 1856, enlisted in Company E of the Sixth, was wounded twice, I think four times, Married to Frances Jean Cooter, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, 1865. They had five children, four of whom were present at the death of their father. That's cool. These, together with the aged wife and six grandchildren, mourned the departure of the father of this father of the family. He was converted and united with the Methodist Church in Newcastle, Wisconsin. Do you ever hear of Newcastle? Yeah. It's called Campbellsport now. Yeah. And has always continued a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some six years ago, some six years ago, after the wound he took in 1863, some six years ago his health failed, and during these years he's been a great sufferer, but patiently looked forward to the promised rest in heaven. He died August 21st, 1911. There is Amos Leffler. Hats off to an iron brigader. And that's his tombstone in Exeter, Nebraska. There is John Gibbon again. I was not a Wisconsin soldier and have not been honorably discharged, meaning his service wasn't up yet. He was still in the service. But at the judgment day, I want to be with the Wisconsin men. And so our purpose here tonight was to just tell the story of the common soldier as best we can because it's the least we can do. I'd ask you to give a round of applause to Company E of the Sixth. If there's anybody here who has served our country and the armed forces, please rise for another round of applause. Thank you for your service. God bless you all. Yes, ma'am. By the way, if I don't know the answer, I'll make it up. It's okay. <laughs> I hope not. Did John Leffler buy his service or in uh become a U.S. citizen? Did he apply to become a citizen? He was a U.S. citizen before he entered the armed forces. When he came down? So when he came down in 1856. Oh, yeah. okay. Good question. I've never heard that one. Was it a requirement to be a U.S. citizen in order to be no. in the service? No. There were, there were Deutsch, the, the, the Germans in the army. There were a lot of Irishmen. There were Mexicans. Okay. There were a lot of people in foreign countries, but some saw it as their ticket to citizenship. I guarantee you. Yes? You have 
have students that are Gaffneys? I do not. I have a family who owns the land that Gaffney farmed. Okay, I thought you said you had students. I was going to say, I thought um, Gaffneys are Irish, they would be Catholic. We have said Catholics too. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't film that, did you, Ken? Sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. In 1861, some of them were listed as being drafted on the registry? No, that D O doesn't mean drafted. Is that what you were seeing? It actually it's listed ditto. Drafted. Um, Were they drafted in like a <coughs> militia or? I don't know what you're saying, what you're seeing, because in 1861 they were all volunteers. The first draft happened in 1863. No, no, I just saw, I saw drafted. On the roster of volunteers? Okay, not all of those went in 61. If they were part of Company E of the 6th and they entered in 63, they could have been drafted but still on the roster. Because that is the complete roster of all oh, who okay. served, not just the boys of 61. I got another question. I hope it's as good as that one, because I made that. No, that, that was the truth. <laughs> well, the Eastern, they were sent to the East. Now, were they reinforced as they lost people, or um, that, the unit dwindle in size? The question was, were more Western boys sent to replace the, the ones who were lost? That's where the 24th Michigan <laughs> went up there. The 24th Michigan showed up in camp in brand spanking new uniforms. And they arrived to muster in front of the survivors of the other armed brigade regiments and they received the coldest reception you could imagine because the 6th and the 2nd and the 7th and the 19th said you haven't earned that black hat yet so they were shocked by that but after Gettysburg when they took the most casualties of any of the regiments of the Iron Brigade but also gave all worse than they got against the North Carolina regiment they were accepted now, to your question, after Gettysburg, when the unit is decimated, they walked into battle with 1,889 men, and they left 1,212 on the field, killed, missing, or wounded. So there wasn't much left. Now, some of those came back later, but they started filling in this all-Western regiment with, here it comes, guys from New York <laughs> and other Eastern states. And so it lost that particular identity of an Iron Brigade of the West. Ma'am? Would, would all the local Fondelac and rural area be in that, that company? No. Um, there were men from Fond du Lac and most Wisconsin regiments. There, were, there was a guy from Fond du Lac who fought in the Illinois regiment. Sometimes it was a matter of where you were when the war started. Sometimes the regiment you wanted to get into was full and you just wanted to serve, so you signed up elsewhere. <coughs> But the Fox Valley is very well represented in the Iron Brigade, at a minimum. And would it vote on Cemetery Stone? Or... <coughs> I'm sorry? Would it would a headstone note necessarily whether the, the person was in Company E? It would generally say the regiment, and probably many of them have the, the company letter also. If you go to Ramsey Cemetery, that's where Brown and Bragg are buried. And they've got some pretty impressive stones. <coughs> I said there's if there's time for one more story, do I have your permission? Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at the time. Anyway, <laughs> back to Brown and Bragg. And maybe I shouldn't tell the story because I'm so afraid I'm going to get something wrong. Could you leave the room? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, at Antietam, wearing that brand new to him captain's coat, which had been given to him by his friend and law partner, Edward Bragg. Edwin A. Brown was coming through a picket fence, leading his troops into battle, calling encouragement when he was killed immediately by a bullet that struck him in his mouth and came out the back of his head. So, as he lay there, his death was recorded by a man named Andrew Deacon, also of the 6th Wisconsin, who gathered up some of Brown's personal effects, because that's what you would do to make sure they got back home to the family. Again, this is a head wound. He's wearing Bragg's coat. Bragg is the guy who had just gotten a uniform with a red silk lining, the one who told Nick Gaffney, it would be all right, my chicken. The troops knew that Bragg had been hit in the cornfield, and they saw that red silk lining, and we can only assume they thought it was a mortal wound. So knowing that one of the officers of Company E was killed, the word comes back to Fond du Lac, where both Bragg and Brown were prominent men. Bragg especially was prominent in politics. And so, as was their wont in those days, they gathered in the parlor of the widow Bragg to console her, to offer her their support. And among those doing the consoling 
was Ruth Brown. Then came word that a coffin had been delivered to Chicago and somehow the contents of the coffin were revealed. They might have dropped it, the seal, the lead seal on the coffin might have popped open and they discover it wasn't Bragg at all. It was Brown. And so Mrs. Bragg has to now console the widow Brown, who in reality is the one who had lost her husband. Just that kind of story makes the Civil War to me come alive. I, I share that stuff with my kids at school. I think that's stuff that, the, that they need to know. Did I get that right? Yeah. There was also a letter that his father had sent to him that he never got. And it said that he heard that Bragg was killed and that he was wounded and asked how he was. Did you all hear that? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Ma'am? Do you know how many served from Wisconsin? I used to. I'm thinking in the mid-30s. There is, at Pamplin Park, which is in, outside of Petersburg, you got a better number? 92,000. That's what I said, 92,000. <laughs> <laughs> 33 times. Uh, yeah, I'm not a math guy. But at Pamplin Park, there's a list of all the numbers from every state that served. Thank you for that. I'll mess up again down the road. Other questions? Otherwise, thank you. Thank you for honoring these men tonight. Thank you for honoring the rest who have served and wish you a good night. God bless you all. Thank you.